Welcome to World Have Your Say. Well, I don't think many of us saw this coming. The European Union has won the Nobel Peace Prize. Do you think it's deserved? We'll use the hashtag WHYS. Also, many of you are expressing shock at the gun attack on a 14-year-old Pakistani girl. She says she was promoting girls' education. The Taliban says she's promoting secularism. And then there's Lance Armstrong. Millions of you bought into his story. Wonder how many of you still believe it. Wherever you are in the world, we're live here on BBC World News. Your contributions are very welcome. Let me introduce you to our first guest. Aisha Cleland is a writer and dancer. She's originally from the US. She spent a great deal of time in Spain, and she's live with us from Berlin. Pascal Emmanuel Goubre is a writer and entrepreneur. He's written an article on Forbes.com today, which has been read by an awful lot of people. He's live with us from Paris. Well, both of you, you're very welcome. I'm interested to hear you talk this one through. Aisha, perhaps you could lead us off here. Does the EU deserve the prize? Well, for me, that's a really tricky, tricky question. I'm not even sure what peace looks like in, in these modern times. I'm not sure that I believe the European U Union deserves it or doesn't deserve it at this point. I'm not sure that I know enough about why they've won and who exactly we mean by the European Union. Um, do we mean the people of Europe, the governments of Europe? It's a really tricky question. So until I know more, I'm not sure that I can answer that directly but what i will say is my first reaction was that it's a strange timing for the european union to be getting the nobel peace prize um especially that today is columbus day in spain at least and at the beginning of the week it was columbus day in the u.s which is synonymous for much of the world with colonialism genocide slavery um which were all the foundation for capitalism which is not working so well for much of europe right now so it seems a strange timing to win the Nobel Peace Prize. That's my first, my first reaction. Uh, I, I think that uh, what happened today was very interesting. I think that the European Union uh, definitely deserves the prize because for the past 60 years, it's been the first time in European history in since millennia that there hasn't been peace that there hasn't been war in Europe. My generation and my par parents' generation are the first generation of Europeans to not know what it is to be at war. And that's a tremendous accomplishment, and it's an accomplishment that was built in large part by the European Union, because it was the European Union that brought the countries together, brought them so close together that not only is there peace, but nobody can imagine that there can be war. Like, if you, if you ask someone, well, is France going to invade Belgium at some point in the next year, everybody would laugh. Like, it's not even thinkable that there can be war in Europe right now, whereas only 60 years ago, it was the place with the, wor the greatest war in, in human history. And for a millennium before that, there had been more over and over again for every generation, but and suppose, in large part that's... I suppose the question here, Pascal, is whether the European Union should take the credit for the fact that countries, including the UK, Germany and France, have not ended up at war. If you're watching, wherever you are in the world, I wonder if you think the EU does deserve the credit Pascal gives us. You can uh, uh, post at facebook.com slash world have your say. Let's pull up one message here from Alex, who's written on Facebook. I come from Greece. And you are talking about peace and democracy when our partners in Europe are imposing the harshest measures to our people. That's not democracy, that's dictatorship. Well, I imagine someone who's got a view on this is uh, Milo Yanopoulos, who's editor-in-chief of ColonelMag.com. He joins us from central London to join uh, Aisha's and Pascal's conversation. Milo, do you think this is an inappropriate timing, bearing in mind what's happening in Greece and elsewhere? It's a little worse than inappropriate, and I have to ask with all due respect to Pascal if he's picked up a newspaper or watched a TV report in the last uh, couple of years. Um, now look, the Nobel Peace Prize has been a joke for a very long time. I mean, when Kissinger was awarded it, um, you know, it, it, it began its long kind of uh, decline into absurdity. But what's happened this year is a little bit worse than hum humour. It's a little bit worse than a bad joke, and it's actually quite offensive. We now know 
that the, um, the European Fiscal Union project, which was always a political, uh, political project and, and, and not a, a, an economic one, okay. is tearing Europe apart. We can see the rise of nationalism, the rise of extremism. We see, you know, Greeks on the... St I mean, Angela Merkel, when she visited uh, Athens this week, there were very serious concerns about whether she'd make it out alive. Um, you know, 7,000 troops were mobilized to protect this woman. Um, the, the, the euro, which has, which has been such a terrible disaster for the people of Europe, um, is probably the single biggest factor draw, uh, driving countries in Europe towards hostility with one another. Um, you know, uh, it's driving up factionism, it's driving up hatred, uh, racial, racial hatred, and, and all sorts of social problems. And the, the EU has proven itself to be the very worst um, advocate for, for peace and certainly for democracy um, that, that one could well, imagine. The, and, and so it's not just a bad joke anymore, it's actually actively the, deeply there's offensive. There's a lot of criticisms that you can make about the EU. I mean, certainly the EU is not perfect and certainly lots of people have very well-founded criticisms of the EU, but the, the fact of the matter remains that the last time France and Germany went to war 50 million people died. The, the, the time before that, 10 million people died. The time before that, it set the continent on fire, and so on and so on. And now, now we're talking, just a few months ago, we spoke about Mercosi, like France and Germany are so united that we come up with a new word to to designate both of them together, it's inimaginable that yeah, France and Germany will all, go to war. And the reason well and for that is... I'm sorry, I have to jump in. I'm sorry, I have to jump in. When, is, when are we going to get to a point when we stop saying that peace is only when bombs are not dropped. I think it's more than that. It has to be more than that, 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 that people have to die or guns have to be, and, 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 and guns have been firing off, at least ones with plastic bullets in them, all over Spain and in Greece. I was on the ground two or three years ago uh, in uh, the Acampada with the Indignados in, in Barcelona, and the police were more than brutal to a very peaceful pro protest. I'm not sure that bombs not dropping is enough to equal peace. I think that's a really um, inadequate way of, of, of defining peace in these times. Well, that's how it feels un until you get a bomb dropped on you, then. You know, bombs feel like I, war. I, I mean, I yes. I don't think so. I think, I think when, when you have no food, you have no job, and you have no way out, that, that's, an, that, I mean, that's also something that you need to think about. No, I, 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 I agree. I, I'm, there's lots of stuff that's both gone wrong with the European both project. But the lives both destroy, I mean, countries. I should, having, I should give, um, I should give Pascal economic. a chance to respond to the points that you've made. Yes, sorry. Sorry. Okay, yes. Uh, no, I, I agree with you that the economic situation in many European countries is very serious, but I would make two points to that. First of all, the fact of the matter is that Europeans on the whole have never been richer and more prosperous. Uh, and second, compared to the rest of the world, I think that's pretty obvious. The other topics that were mentioned were places like Syria, like Pakistan. I think life is much better in Europe than Syria and Pakistan. And I think people in Syria and Pakistan would say that they can tell the difference between war and peace and the difference between uh, not eating and eating. And the second thing is nobody today can imagine a, sec a third world war coming from Europe. 60 years ago, that wasn't true. 100 years ago, that wasn't true. 200 years ago, that, was, that wasn't true. And the reason for that is that all of the countries in Europe are so interlinked in terms of trade, in terms of politics, that it's unthinkable. It's not just unlikely, it's unthinkable that countries in Europe are going to go to full-scale war. And that's in large part thanks to the European project. Well, Ayosha and uh, Pascal and Milo, let me read you this message which has been posted on our Facebook page. It's from Wycliffe, who gets involved in World Have Your Say from Nairobi. He writes, kudos to the European Union. The financial aid they give towards sustainable peace in war zones is tremendous. And Milo, the EU does just that, doesn't it? It supports uh, countries in many difficult situations around the world and has done for many years. Well, so do lots of other uh, um, international organizations which are much more transparent and much better um, you know, at accounting for the money they spend, um, certainly much more democratic. Um, you know, the, the point here is that um, we may not be on the verge of bombs dropping 
um, in Paris, but we are in a situation where extraordinary uh, racial and nationalist tensions are ripping the continent apart. And the blame for that can be laid um, to some degree uh, in this disastrous attempt at uh, fiscal union. Um, the European Union um, you know, has eroded democracy in the West um, like no other institution, like no other social or cultural or political force. It is an unaccountable, um, extraordinarily, um, uh, in, in some cases, extraordinarily sinister organization, um, which sounds, sounds slightly hysterical, but um, if you look at the, the, way they, the way they spend money, the way that this, this, this organization well, operates to protect itself, this is not an organization that should be the recipient of a peace prize dedicated to uh, those humans and institutions that are enlightening humanity, because well, that's Mother, the opposite of what you strong words there. You say it's a slightly sinister organization. I wonder if those of you watching around the world perceive the European Union to be that way. Before we bring in our next guest to speak with Milo and Pascal and Aisha, let me read you um, a couple of messages. Um, comments coming in from Mauritius, India, Iraq, Nigeria, Liberia, Iran, South Africa and Germany. In fact, I'll give you those comments in a moment because I'm absolutely certain that Sony Kapoor is chomping at the bit to join this discussion. He runs a think tank in Brussels, but he's live with us from central London. Good to have you back on World Have Your Say, Sony. What would you like to say to Milo? Uh, well, I think that uh, sin somebody said that it sounds a bit hysterical calling the European Union uh, sinister, and I think it is actually hysterical. The record is very clear. Uh, if you actually imagine the situation today, and I think part of this is we are of a generation which has forgotten what war looks like, but if you imagine India and Pakistan coming out tomorrow, or the whole of you know, Israel and the Ara Arabic region making peace, we are talking about something which was actually, at the time that it was conceived, much beyond that. This is just after they had killed each other, and as someone said, 50 million people had died. These countries came together to the point where, as someone said, just the idea of France invading Belgium or Germany invading France makes you laugh. You cannot even imagine that. This surely has to account for one of the greatest civilizational achievements in history. The problem, of course, is in the present context, the European Union is conflated with what is going on with the Euro area and the Euro crisis. And this is an unfortunate comparison. Sony, but that is also why. Sony, let me just yeah. jump in there, because as you're saying that, you can't see this, but I can. Aisha is uh, furrowing her brow. Why do you look so disapproving? Well, I think it's fantastic that um, we can't imagine Paris and Brussels going to war and, and it hasn't happened for six decades, but I think it was only four decades ago that most of the Caribbean and Africa were in independence wars with, with lots of Europe. This was four decades ago, so I mean it's fantastic that, you haven't, that Europe hasn't fought each other, but it certainly has done lots of damage in other parts of the world. I think that's the first part. And the second reason I'm furrowing my brow is that um, what exactly is the European Union without the Euro? I'm not so sure. I mean, well, from living in Spain, I see that um, unless there's a football match going on, no one's Spanish. Everyone's Catalan or uh, Basque or Galician. And then as soon as there's, you know, national football, as soon as there's the World Cup, then everyone is Spanish. And I can and see, I feel I can see, Sony, about I can see Sony wanting to respond to that. But Sony, just hold your mm -hmm. thought Please, for sure. a moment because uh, we're going to have to pause here on BBC World News and then we'll be right back with Mil Milo, Aisha, Pascal and Sony as well. And of course, lots of you watching around the world too. Most recent calls we've received are from the UK and India. If you prefer to get involved uh, online rather than calling us up, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. We also use Skype. And frankly, if we're not using anything that you think we ought to be, send us a note, tell us, and we'll happily get World Have Your Say onto that platform as well. Now, let's go back to Pascal, who's live with us from Paris. Sony's in central London, and Milo's in a separate studio in central London. Sony, there's been lots of criticism of problems within the Eurozone now and within the European Union now. Do you think we need to put that to one side uh, to, to acknowledge the achievements of the European Union? Well, I think the reason the timing of this prize is brilliant is because it manages to balance what is a recognition of real historical achievement together with the 
current very fragile situation where the breakup of the Eurozone and also indeed the European Union is a real possibility. And what the message the Norwegians are sending is, here you have something that is special. Here you have something that is worth preserving. And if this helps change the terms of the debate from what has now become very petty and parochial, and as someone said, the conflicts between the Germans and the Greeks, etc. If this helps remind leaders and remind citizens what the achievements of the European Union have been, that the problems now, the very fact that we are not using guns but words to try and resolve them, means that we need to get over our pettiness and sit down and get over Milo, this crisis. Are you, Milo, are you it's being brilliant. petty? No, I mean, this, this, whole, this whole thing is slightly absurd. I mean, you know, let's get back to what we're actually talking about here. Awarding a peace prize to bloated, incompetent bureaucrats, like people like Van Rompuy and Baroness Ashton and, and Jose Manuel Barbarossa. I mean, are, are we really saying that these people are the shining light of humanity and, and, and uh, spreading peace in the world? Of course not. You talk about the accomplishments of the European Union. What have they been except to make rich nations poorer and to bankrupt poor nations? Because I, I, I can't really see it. <laughs> That's so ridiculous because the prize is not for those bureaucrats. The prize is for the whole project, for all the countries. It's a prize that is to you and to me and all the citizens of the European Union. Well, and I don't the know fact what you'll that you'll be spending your 0.002 euros on, but I'm certainly not going to go very far from where I'm sitting. Um, but you know that the idea that that we should all collectively be, be given this sort of slap on the back for crippling our economies and, and ruining and Spain. our ruining Portugal our southern European neighbours. Portugal and Spain were neighbors. dictatorships until recently. Greece emerged from a long civil war, and the reason that we are seeing the levels of prosperity, which yes, are under threat now, but the very reason that they got to these levels of prosperity, the very reason that there's we no have peace of, in the Balkans. There's no level of prosperity in economies that are built on debt. There has been no prosperity in Greece. It has been a sham. It has been built on debt and it's been operated by a corrupt government whose accounts never stacked up, um, you know, on the basis of money dished out by other countries. That's not prosperity. I'm sorry, but that same argument can be made for Britain if you're talking about economies being absolutely. built on debt or the United Abs States. Absolutely. I just wish we weren't giving so much money away to Europe every year, in, in which case our, 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 our own debt would be smaller. But you're absolutely right. That argument can and should and it, it should be and is being would made. Would you rather that Britain and Germany and France be at war and that we're spending much huge, greater amounts of money managing well, conflicts about, at our borders. You talk I mean, about hysteria. Prosperity you talk about has, hysteria. You're saying either we have this vast, unaccountable bureaucracy of Europe or we're at war with each other? First Come of all, now. the European bureaucracy is not vast. It's not unaccountable. It's and not, it's very <laughs> tiny if you just look at the proportion you spend on drink and go, going out night out. The <laughs> fact that we have the privilege to have the single market, we are able to travel and live anywhere in the 27 countries, the fact that we have prosperity at the borders, which has contributed to a level of gross national product that is unprecedented in human history. Well, These are all wonderful achievements. The fact that we have not gone on war, the fact that we champion tackling the environment, the fact that we have delivered international development in a better way than say US aid has, all of these are achievements that are the end result of collective civilizational cooperation and between Ma willing member states. And Milo, before you come back in, Pascal, you're giving us every facial expression I've ever seen on the show there. Tell us your thoughts. I'm trying to guess, but I can't. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with what the latest guest has said. Uh, almost, almost a uh, hundred percent. I agree with Milo that the EU is sometimes an unaccountable bureaucracy. I agree that it wastes a lot of money. I agree that it has a lot of problems. But the great thing about being enlightened hu human beings is that we can have a nuanced perspective and acknowledge all of the problems that the EU has while also acknowledging the amazing historical role it has played in making Europe, for the first time in its millennia of history, a continent of peace. And also increasing prosperity by boosting free trade and free markets inside Europe, which is something that I know Milo likes. I think it's well, a all three of you, let me, just, let me just ask you to pause just one moment, because of course, as you're talking, Lots and lots of people are responding. We've had calls from Jamaica, Norway, and India in the last couple of moments. Also one from Berlin. Richard is with us live. Hi, Richard. What's your point? 
Hi. I wanted to say, uh, listening to this debate, which is very, very interesting, that the real reason why, why uh, Europe de uh, deserves the Peace Prize is because, of course, it's not just what it's done in the past, it's what it's going to do in the future. Europe has set an example of how to unify nations, very disparate nations, and without that unification across the planet of all the disparate nations coming together into a single unified bloc, we cannot hope to solve the problems of the future. The thing future. is, Richard, it's not looking that unified at the moment, is it? Uh, the disunity in Europe is merely an economic problem which has been caused by pressure from the enemies of Europe, namely Britain and America, who wish, of course, to see the European project fail because they wish to see power retained in their hands. But Europe looks far wider. It looks towards unity not only within Europe but across the planet, and that's the reason why it deserves the Peace Prize. Well, Richard, thank you very much indeed. Richard thinks the EU is a deserving winner. Aisha in Berlin is back with us. Now, you're American, though. You've spent plenty of time in in Europe and some European politicians would like the European Union to match the federal system that you have in the US. Do you think that the unity in Europe is comparable with what you have in America? Not at all. <laughs> um, I I'm not even sure if I can explain why, why I think it isn't, but it just, not, not at all. I, I, I think, as I said before, that a lot of what Europe is about whether or not they go to war and the euro um, and I'm not sure how, how solid the euro is right now to hold all of these disparate nations people's histories together um, maybe someone else can answer that question but I, I don't really have faith that the euro can really hold s such different nations together well let's bring up that thought. issue um, with my second is that well, a lot well, of this well, talk should, right now sounds you, very American should, let me jump in there because you raise an interesting point let's yeah. put it to a guest who's just joining us live now from Copenhagen. Karen Melchior is a Danish diplomat, though she's speaking to us not on behalf of the government, but just on behalf of herself. Do you think, Karen, that the European Union has the necessary unity to claim this prize? Does it uh, really represent the 500 million people that Mr Barroso was claiming earlier? I think Mr Barroso's claim is, is truthful. There are... 500 million people in Europe. But if we look at the text of the press statement from the Nobel Peace Committee, then it's for the work being done for the last 60 years of providing peace and stability for the countries that are part of the European Union, and not least the institutions that went before the European Union. They mention the Peace, uh, the peace Prize being given to uh, people working on reconciliation between France and Germany before. And in the words of Schumann, the objective was to make peace not only a project, but make it unthinkable. I'm going to have to jump in here. I'm very sorry, just because we're coming right up to the end of the half hour and I can't shift that back at all but lots of people are agreeing with you and pointing to the success of keeping Germany and France apart I just wonder if that's enough to win the Nobel Peace Prize thanks to all of our guests in this segment <laughs> Well, let's talk about Bilala Yousafzai, the last story there in our bulletin. She's in a hospital in Rawalpindi. Doctors say her progress over the next few days will be critical, and there's been a day of prayer for her across Pakistan. Now, most of us know her because of a diary which she wrote for the BBC Urdu's website. In it, she detailed the struggles of living under the Taliban in the Swat Valley, and she was particularly critical of the closing of girls' schools. Let's speak to three people about this. Rush to Doha is a charity worker in rural Pakistan and joins us live from Islamabad. Ghul Bakari is a freelance journalist based in Lahore and joins us via webcam. And Ursula Ashraf is a human rights activist from Afghanistan who started campaigning at the age of 16 in Pakistan. All three of you, you are very welcome here on World Have Your Say. I'm, I'm quite happy to sit out here and listen to the three of you talk about this. Rash, to share your feelings about what's happened this week. 
I think there's only one way uh, one can explain it was complete outrage. Uh, and uh, as we have seen, as soon as the news of the attack uh, came up, uh, there was outrage across the country. I don't think there's anybody uh, who, who feels that, um, you know, who cannot condemn this thing. It is against our laws. It is against our religion. It is against our culture. And uh, I think there was just what you were watching uh, across the country uh, is a sense of coming together and perhaps that's the only silver line in this tragic incident is how even in this um, in this time when Malala has been attacked she has brought us all together and I think that's a, that's in some ways the only wonderful thing about uh, this tragic incident I think uh, the, the the tragedy and the way it has uh, basically shake uh, everyone is not only limited by by Pakistan. Um, I can speak of Afghanistan, the other side of the border, and believe that the people of Afghanistan, particularly girls who are going to school, taking their risk for their lives every day, uh, probably we are we are Afghanistan people are one of the best who understands the the, the depth of this. Um, terrible tragedy um, that Malala have experienced. The solidarity is globally for, for Malala and what she suffered from and it's also um, there has been prayers uh, in Afghanistan today and tomorrow uh, there will be also um, school uh, like nationwide school prayers, school children prayers uh, for safety and survival of uh, this uh, brave young girl. You know, I think um, <clears throat> this issue, there's a, there's a very um, serious issue at hand here. Uh, what's happened with Malala has happened because um, she represented something that the Taliban hate. Um, she was killed, uh, or I'm sorry, she, the attempted uh, assassination of Malala really represents uh, on the part of uh, Taliban to try and finish off uh, girls education in those areas uh, because with women's education uh, societies are transformed and that is the transformation exactly that the Taliban do not want and uh, as far as condemnation and unification is concerned yes I agree to a large extent but we have also had I mean it's not that easy it's not like we have come to a turning point uh, with Malala's death at this uh, at this point in time in, within Pakistan, because there are leaders, um, uh, the leader in fact of the largest Islamic uh, uh, political party, the Jamaat Islami, uh, did say that equally responsible are those people who used her. Now I don't understand what that means. Um, his words were that this uh, uh, girl was just a child. Children do not know anything. Uh, they have no commitments, and the child was used, and uh, whilst condemning the assassination attempt on her, uh, the gentleman also placed blame on those who used her. Um, also, at this point in time, there are, uh, there are lots of voices on social media uh, talking about why she became famous. Uh, was it just because uh, she did not uh, uh, get injured as a result of a drone attack? Now they're mixing up this, uh, this, there is confusion being created. There are questions I see on Twitter uh, about uh, why uh, is Afia Siddiqui forgotten, well, for example. Cool, let, me, cool, let me jump in here because we can, we can be reasonably clear. The Taliban has said that she was promoting secularism. It's also said it may consider changing its policy of not attacking journalists because it's so frustrated at how much sympathetic coverage has been given of the attack on uh, Malala. And at the moment, there have been a number of arrests relating to the attack, although the person who is believed to have masterminded it is still at large. I do wonder, and perhaps I could ask all three of you this, whether you think it would be responsible to encourage other teenage girls in the Swat Valley and elsewhere in Pakistan to say out loud they believe in girls' schools remaining open. Do you think that now is too dangerous to do? Perhaps, Rashda, you could respond to that. Yes, uh, let me just start by saying that, uh, you know, in this entire tragedy, uh, what one has to remember is that uh, uh, all the various realities of Pakistan are at play. 
play. So you have uh, at one point the the sort of brutality uh, that you see uh, where you know gunmen can can shoot at uh, young people, but you also have the reality of Pakistan that you have people like Malala. We are very proud of her. She's an inspiration. She's an icon for many people. But I think what is also important for the world to know is that there are many Malalas. So for every uh, student who goes to school in Suat, in Fata, etc., they are, uh, it's almost like an act of defiance uh, that, that they do. So there are many such people. But, and, but, uh, Rajda, I want to come in on the, I want to jump in here, and Ozaro, I'd like you to come in too. Yeah. Should we be encouraging teenage girls to carry out acts of defiance? Surely this attack proves it's too dangerous. We shouldn't expect children to carry uh, a campaign well, against the Taliban. Yes, uh, I mean, there is no way to stop um, encouraging girls in, uh, and female women and girls to go to school. I mean, I don't know what is the particular definition of Taliban from secularism, uh, but from the statement of this uh, leader of uh, Islamic party, Jamaat -e Islami of Pakistan, I really don't know what he means really by that. Where is that question of the obligation for getting education for girls, uh, which is a ob clear obligation by the sayings of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him? Where is that obligation uh, in this whole uh, process? I mean, uh, uh, Malala, in, as, as I said, back in Afghanistan, we have millions of Malalas that are going to school. They are getting their not only religious uh, studies, but also besides religious studies, their scientific studies. In this, this is not only our national responsibility, but also our religious responsibility that guide us that we should consciously accept the principles of our religion. And I have, I don't find any clear justification for stopping girls for going to school. I mean, that's, that, that's very point clear. That you say that it is a religious obligation of all Muslims to support girls and boys getting equal education. The three of you, let me read you a tweet we've received from Sarah in Barcelona. She says, more women and girls should take her as an example. And uh, here's another slider from Tim Harcourt, a writer in Sydney. He's also been tweeting, and that actually is on a separate subject, so I'll read that later. I don't think we need to know about the European Union now. But uh, we're coming back to that point of, of being an example. Ghoul, what's your view of this? Is it too dangerous to take her as an example now? I, I think that's a, that's a pretty complicated um, question to answer. Clearly, um, the, the state uh, is not doing its job, and nobody should have to be so brave as to uh, have to take on the Taliban on their own. The state ought to be uh, doing its work uh, in terms of clearing the areas and bringing economic and social and um, uh, political and mainly educational uh, policies into play such that people feel protected. Not just feel, but they actually are protected. Why are Malalas having to be so brave? You are right in saying that but given the fact that the state is feeling at it, that is why people are doing this. Everybody, all journalists, all students, anybody who is in these affected areas mm -hmm. is braving the Taliban on their own. And so that's and the point that that's the point that Ozala was making, which is that perhaps they're not getting the same publicity that Malala received, but there are many girls already making similar stands. We're gonna take a break. Uh, right now, but I'm curious to ask Ozala, uh, Ghul, and Rashta uh, how they would uh, speak to the Taliban if they could. What message would they send to them at the end of this very difficult week for people who support equal rights for men and women in Pakistan? We'll take a break and then we'll hear what they have to say. Hi there, Ros Atkins here with you on World Have Your Say. We're talking about Malala, the 14-year-old Pakistani girl. She wrote a, a diary for BBC Urdu complaining about the difficulties of living under the Taliban in the Swat Valley of Pakistan. This week, she was shot in the head and she remains in a critical condition. Yadab has tweeted us saying, we're praying from Nepal, get well soon. Malala and Kashif is watching us in Saudi Arabia tweeting, get well soon Malala, you are in our thoughts and our hearts. Well, let's go back to Ozala 
Gaul and Rashda, our three guests in London, Islamabad and Lahore. And I asked all three of you to think about what you would say to someone who had sympathy with the Taliban in the Pakistan after uh, this week. Rashda, what would you say? You know, I would say that uh, anybody who has sympathy with the Taliban or any uh, group that perpetrates uh, violence, uh, that, you know, violence will always beget violence. And that is not the answer. Whether the violence is uh, perpetrated by the Taliban or it is the drone attacks or it is anybody else, uh, we do not want violence. And I think the nation has uh, spoken about mm -hmm. that, that we don't, this is not the kind of people we are. Uh, we are a peace-loving people and uh, we want, and essentially, I think Malala has actually put this so beautifully in one of her interviews and uh, she says that all she wants is a normal life. Our children want a normal life where they can go to school, they can uh, get educated, they can work, they can watch movies, they can uh, do everything that normal children want to do. And I Rashta, think that's what that, we thank all you, have to thank, strive for. Rashta, thank you for those thoughts. I'm, I'm interested to hear from all three of you in the short time we've got. Gore, what would you say to someone who supports the Taliban in Pakistan? You know, I'm very clear in my mind. Um, those who are sitting far away in the safety of their homes uh, and talking from their rooms mostly, it's those people who uh, show sympathies. And uh, I would ask them to think back about the time when that girl in SWAT was lashed. Uh, and that's when a, a big change took place. And, after, uh, and, and just before that, the, when the Taliban had moved from Shangla to Bonaire, mm. and the world was talking about only 60 kilometers from Islamabad, that's when everybody's uh, attitude changed. The people and, in the government, the different political parties. And Gaul, it's I'm going to jump in there because I want to hear from Ozala. Just quickly, Ozala, if yeah, you would, definitely. your message for someone watching who has uh, sympathy My with the message Taliban. to Taliban and particularly to the masterminds and to the spiritual and practical material leaders of the Taliban is that please, for goodness sake, for God's sake, stop using children's education, girls' education as, as, as a political means. This was a prescription of the masterminds of the Taliban for Afghanistan for the last 10 to 15 years during the Taliban rules and after their rules. Schools in Afghanistan have been attacking every day. Yesterday we had a school blown up. So this is something that they should stop using and they should take their different Ozala, fronts. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks to Gaul and Rashtra. It's been fascinating listening to you talk. The reason I was jumping in is that there has been another huge talking point this week, perhaps not as serious as Malala, but nonetheless something that matters to a lot of people. Lance Armstrong has been accused of being a serial cheat by the doping authorities, the anti-doping authorities in the States. Peter lives in Queensland. He's lived through having cancer. He recorded this video for us about his thoughts on Lance Armstrong. He and the bike I purchased when diagnosed were a major part of my personal fight and success with cancer. I've read and heard about his supposed fall from grace as a sports cheat and drug user, and I li liken my approach to that of a child who discovered his father has committed a serious crime. I'll not judge him, maybe berate him, and get angry, but never stop admiring him for the many great other things that he has done. I put to you in his defense that he was a sports cheat and drug user in a sport where there is little doubt that the top 10 plus internationally competitive riders were also drug cheats because if you weren't, you simply weren't competitive. No excuse, just a reason. Thanks to Peter for recording that for us. A couple of comments here on Lance Armstrong. Randy said as a tweet, he cheated other people to raise money for cancer support. That's pure fraud. So should we encourage fraud just because he helped a charity and uh, Ramon in Trinidad also tweeting using the WHYS hashtag if he was so successful at hiding the doping for so long then maybe all these anti-doping agencies are full of incompetence. Well I don't know if that's true Ramon but they've certainly uh, improved how they go about trying to catch people who are cheating in cycling. Thank you very much indeed to all of you who have sent in comments on Lance Armstrong, on Malala and also on the European Union. We spoke to Nuda a little bit earlier on the program. In one hour's time, she's going to be hosting the latest radio edition of World Have Your Say on BBC 
World Service Radio. She'll be talking about whether the EU deserves a place in the Nobel list of Peace Prize winners, because that's where it's going to be. So if you'd like to take part and you didn't get on today, uh, get in touch through facebook.com slash world have your say. We'll be talking about the EU Peace Prize at uh, one hour's time, BBC World Service Radio. You can stream it online and I'll speak to you very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>